Today's video has been brought to you by Manta Sleep. Do you find yourself not being able to get a good night's rest and running low on energy throughout the day? Maybe you need a nap. Problem is, light sources tend to mess with sleep. Luckily, Manta Sleep is here to get you the best sleep of your life. Manta has a bunch of different sleep masks which offer 100% blackout for a much deeper sleep. They're soft, breathable, completely adjustable, and extremely durable. And most of all, comfortable, putting zero pressure on your eyelids or eyelashes. They offer quite a few different sleep masks, but the one I chose is the Manta Sound Mask, which I personally love. It not only provides all the comfortability and functionality as their standard masks, but also has Bluetooth connectivity for people who like to fall asleep to different sounds like music, podcasts, or even the sound of the rainforest or something, I don't know. Right now, Manta is offering 10% off for anyone who uses my discount code in the description. So if you want to get the best sleep possible while also helping out the channel, use my link and get yourself a great sleep mask today. And thanks again to Manta for sponsoring the video. What could possibly go wrong? Bubsy is a complete anomaly. Most people know this by now, but back in the 90s when Sonic was at peak popularity, plenty of other companies tried to hop on the same bandwagon and create their very own mascots with their own series of platformers to try to capitalize on it. It uh really didn't work out very well for just about any of them. Except for Bubsy? Sort of. Bubsy was different, and to this day, I still have no idea why. Annoying, not very popular at all, and with a backlog of games that were never even approaching the realm of good, Bubsy somehow managed to stand the test of time. Likely not out of success, but rather out of stubbornness. With games having come out as recently as last gen, I'm shocked that Bubsy is somehow still around. The Bobcat has way more games under his belt than he has any right to, and today, I'm gonna check out all of them. So let's take a look at every Bubsy game released for various video game consoles throughout the years. All right, so we're gonna just jump right into this. As always, if you've watched my videos before, you already know the drill, but for those that are new, I'm gonna go in chronological order of release and take a look at every Bubsy game that's come out from the first game in the series all the way up until present day. So without further ado, let's take a look at these. Bubsy in Claws Encounters of the Furred Kind, better known as uh, Bubsy. At this point, this game's reputation precedes itself. I don't think I'm the first person to reveal this to you, but it's it's not exactly a revered title. I've played the game a few times before, but found it so difficult that the handful of times I did, I never made it past like the first world. This time though, I wanted to take a genuine crack at seeing what the game had to offer outside of the first stage, and uh, well, I could not do that. Now, I did manage to make it past the first few stages, finding out for the first time that this game actually has boss fights, but outside of that, the game is way too cheap and unfair with limited continues. However, there is a password system to pick up where you left off, so while I didn't have it in me to struggle through the entire game for an indeterminate amount of time, I did take advantage of the password system to at least take a tour of the other levels in the game for the first time. Now, the game was released for both the SNES and Sega Genesis, but I've heard it was developed with the Genesis in mind, seeing as how this is like, sort of partially an attempt at a Sonic clone due to its physics, which I'll talk about in a second, I opted for the Sega version. Okay, now on to the cavalcade of reasons why this game is as frustrating to play as it is. First off, as mentioned a second ago, the physics. They littered the stages with slopes akin to Sonic with none of the control. Bubsy goes from like 0 to 100 with the weirdest ramp up and momentum I've ever seen. It's honestly hard to describe without feeling it yourself, but if you get any kind of speed at all, and I mean literally any, even down to like a crawl, the game will pull you in whatever direction you are going, and you need to actively try to fight it by violently pressing the opposite direction on the D-pad. Coupled with that, it's almost impossible to see incoming hazards. The area of view is so small that enemies come at you way faster than you can react, often hurling projectiles at you out of frame that you literally can't do anything to avoid. It's like that complaint some people have about the Genesis Sonic games and how they benefit so much from being remade and widescreen due to being able to see what's in front of you, only like 5,000 times worse. And unlike Sonic, there's no ring system or health bar, nothing. Instead, you get hit once, you lose a life. And on top of that, sometimes enemy hitboxes just seem to make no sense. Sometimes I just get too close to hazards and then die, so I'm pretty sure hitboxes sometimes extend past the enemy sprites themselves. And to make matters worse, instead of just, you know, dying, you have to watch one of a bunch of different death animations for Bubsy that take like 12 years every single time that you die. 
It's real easy to die, too, considering not only is there a million enemies with the cheapest placement in places you can't even actually see or react to, but this game also has fall damage. This is a 2D platformer with fall damage. I'm not really sure what even counts as too high of a fall either, since sometimes you fall and immediately die, and other times you're just fine. I assume this was implemented due to Bubsy's glide mechanic, but other than mitigating fall damage, the glide really doesn't do a whole lot to aid in platforming, especially when you need to jump down from a high platform, because pretty much 100% of the time, it's a complete leap of faith. So even if you do glide to save yourself from dying from the fall itself, there's a good chance you'll land on a stage hazard or an enemy or something and it'll, it'll kill you anyway. And also, I'm sure most of you know how verbose Bubsy is, so making fun of all the one-liners and stuff he spits out would be low-hanging fruit, so I'm really not even going to touch that, but I don't think you really need to go that far. Going through the rest of the game, or at least browsing through it, I do have to at least give the game a little bit of credit. It's not bad looking. Don't get me wrong, for playability, it's atrocious. Stuff that kills you before you have time to even think often can't even be seen very well because there's so much going on that it all kind of blends together, especially when it comes to the random projectiles. In terms of atmosphere, though, I do have to admit the game is sort of pretty to look at sometimes. The areas are all pretty diverse in terms of theme, and while they don't always hit it out of the park, the usage of color tends to be relatively pleasing and everything really pops, sometimes anyway. Bubsy's a weird one. This won't be the last we see of this as a theme, but it's just such a strange game. There was some decent groundwork here for a game that could have actually been at the very least decent. It has spirit, and they clearly were trying to make something here. The actual game itself, though, is so jank that I can't understand how anyone is supposed to enjoy this. Like, I get they were trying to compete with the big mascot platformer games at the time, but how do you play Mario or Sonic for like three seconds and then not realize that your game isn't ready for prime time? For most other mascot platformers of the week, this is where their story would end. Not Bubsy, though. Somehow, by some miracle, or curse, depending on how you look at it, Bubsy had some degree of staying power. Only a year later, an accolade already managed to pump out a sequel. This time with a much less inflated name. They just went with Bubsy 2 this time. It's surprising enough that the first game even saw a sequel to begin with, but it's even more surprising how they went about it. Once again, it came out for both the SNES and Sega Genesis, and I'm gonna again check out the Genesis version here. Now, Bubsy's main mechanics from the first game, the few that existed anyway, are still here and accounted for. Quick, uncontrollable running, the ability to bounce on top of enemies to take them out, and his signature, I don't know why they decided a bobcat can do this, glide. The controls this time around have been tightened up quite a bit, which is frankly shocking considering they're still pretty atrocious. Bubsy is still really difficult and unwieldy to control, only less so this time around. The gameplay is mostly similar to the first game, but for whatever reason, they took an entirely different approach to not only level design here, but how progression works in general. The first Bubsy game, despite how utterly impossible it is to actually play, in concept, is just a straightforward reach the end of the stage linear platformer. Sure, traversing those stages is easier said than done, but at the end of the day, it's about going right until you win. Bubsy 2, however, was designed completely differently. Not only did they implement a lot more verticality in terms of how the levels are traversed, but they're extremely non-linear. Level exits can be found seemingly anywhere within a stage, and even ones that are just at the very right of a stage will still take a lot of up and down and back and forth to navigate to get to. The game is overall easier though, despite having a lot of cheap enemy placement. The game itself, in general, is just a lot more manageable. At first glance, it might seem like this game has a lot of variety and level themes and stuff, but unfortunately, if you've watched this far, you've probably already seen everything this game has to offer. See, when I brought up progression earlier, it's because Bubsy 2 has a very strange approach to it. Instead of having a handful of levels divided into various worlds, like most 2D platformers, Bubsy 2 divides the game into two halves, and then splits those halves into thirds. When you start the game, you have the option to choose between the east wing and the west wing of the hub, and within each wing are three floors of increasing difficulty. In each floor of both wings, you can choose one of five stages to play in whichever order you want, and then once each set of levels are completed, you face off against a boss before moving on to the next floor. In concept, this seems kind of interesting, but in practice, you'll quickly realize how bland this all actually is. I mentioned earlier that the level themes seem diverse and interesting, but once you beat the first floor of any wing, you'll immediately see how much this game just repeats itself over and over. 
The first floor of both wings consists of levels with themes based on ancient Egypt, space, music, aerial, and medieval times, which at first seems kind of cool. But every subsequent floor consists of levels that are all based on the exact same assets with nothing new to look at aside from the actual stage layout itself. The game is definitely more manageable to play than the first Bubsy game, but boy does it get old fast, and it's not even fun to begin with, so the little charm this game has wears off real fast. I guess I do think it's kinda cool that each floor has a shoot 'em up level, but that also gets old quickly too. There's also a few mini-games scattered throughout the levels, as well as a shop you can visit after each stage is completed to buy some power-ups with these cards you collect as you play through each level. But outside of that, that's all the game really has to offer. The weirdest part, too, is that not only can you pick which wing to start in, but you have the option to select the whole wing or start on specific floors, which, once again, would normally sound kind of a cool option to play the game in whatever order you want, but that's not actually how it works. For some reason, unless you select Grand Tour, which allows you to do the entire game proper, selecting a specific floor has you start in that floor, and then upon completing it, you face off against the final boss, followed by the game just resetting. The progress isn't saved. Found out about that the hard way. Now, there was also a version that came out for the Game Boy, and to my surprise, it actually has a very similar setup, much like its console counterpart. Since it's on the Game Boy though, especially the original Game Boy, it's very limited with only three stages per floor, and uh, it's genuinely god-awful to play. It controls horribly. It is extremely floaty, and it's insanely slow. Now, for the Game Boy version, we only have the music, Egypt, and shoot 'em up levels. These are all present and accounted for, but as you might imagine, they're far less playable. I'll admit, it's pretty impressive that they did try to actually take a crack at making an actual port for this game for the Game Boy, with Bubsy even retaining his glide mechanic, allowing you to fall uh, even slower. But in execution, this sh is not even close to playable based just on how slow the game is alone. So that's Bubsy 2. Much more playable than the first game, but still very much not good. Bubsy 1 was unplayable. Bubsy 2 is a repetitive slog with its only redeeming quality being that you can actually play it, making it an improvement over its predecessor. Hey, real quick, if you're liking the video and want to see more from me, consider subscribing. I know a lot of people like to watch whatever's on their homepage, but YouTube doesn't always do a great job of pushing out content, so if you want to make sure you see future uploads, tap that subscribe button. It really helps out the channel, and that, that's it. That's all I gotta say. Back to the video. So this next one is actually the only game on this list that I've only ever heard about and never once played myself, but that's mostly due to the fact that it was released on a console literally no one owns or owned. Bubsy in Fractured Furry Tales is yet another 2D platformer in the same vein as the first two games, this time though released for a supposedly much more capable system, the Atari Jaguar. Unfortunately, basically none of the console's superior specs were utilized, and instead of having the secret Bubsy game that nobody played that was actually good, we got another piece of sh** that's par for the course at this point. Bubsy in Fractured Furry Tales is actually kind of a weird entry. From what I've read, apparently the game was originally supposed to be a port of the first Bubsy game for the Jaguar. Accolade struck a deal with Atari to become a third-party developer for the Jaguar and licensed the game out. During its development, though, they changed course, as Bubsy 1 had already been on the market for a long time at that point, instead opting to create a brand new game. It apparently uses the same source code as the original Genesis version, which now after playing it actually makes a whole lot of sense in terms of how it plays, but I'll get to that part in a minute. Supposedly, they wanted to use the groundwork of Bubsy 1, but create a whole new storyline while supposedly making the game more difficult to quote-unquote cater to younger and older gamers, whatever that means. And in practice, I don't really think that goal was met. Now, as I said a minute ago, Jaguar Bubsy feels shockingly like Bubsy 1, only with a much slower speed cap. Before reading any information about the game just from playing it myself, I was so confused because as I said, it felt like the controls were actually improved in Bubsy 2, which they were. Once again, they aren't great, but it's a noticeable improvement that makes the game much more playable. But with Bubsy 2's improved controls also came Bubsy 2's non-linear level design. Fractured Furry Tales is basically the worst of both worlds here. It has the jank and physics weirdness of Bubsy 1, coupled with the overly complicated labyrinthian level design of Bubsy 2. This game is a mess. Admittedly, still less of a mess than Bubsy 1, but that's only because you don't go from 0 to 500 miles an hour at the press of a button. The music this time around is also completely different, sounding much more 
ambient than the Saturday morning cartoony music of the first two games. And once again, we do have a good amount of variety in terms of level themes, this time all leaning into a fairy tale aesthetic, from Alice in Wonderland to Jack and the Beanstalk, and it's actually a pretty neat idea that keeps visuals fresh. Unfortunately, that's like literally the only thing I have to say that's good about this game. Once again, it's stupidly hard and has cheap enemy placement, one hit kills, you can't see a goddamn thing that's in front of you for running into it. It's exactly all the same problems that the previous two games had, only somehow made worse than the second game because it's once again a pain in the ass to control. And once again, I wouldn't have even seen the different worlds this game has to offer if not for the fact that luckily this game also has a password system, which did allow me to browse through the game. But I'm gonna be honest here, I'm pretty sure I just can't beat any of the levels. I literally couldn't even get past the first stage, and the game once again doesn't have unlimited continues, which I guess technically is fine given the fact that there is a password system, but I really don't understand how anybody who isn't like a speedrunner is supposed to beat this legitimately. I'm actually sort of kind of let down. I'm not sure why, but I had slightly higher hopes for this one. I thought maybe because it was this exclusive release and because I never really heard anybody talk about this one, I thought it could possibly at least be better than the others. I mean, no news is good news, right? And I thought they would have learned from their past mistakes just a little bit. And considering the controls of Bubsy 2 weren't quite that atrocious, I thought that maybe they'd carry that energy over into this next game. But this is just as much of a dumpster fire as the first two. Only this time around, it's a much less accessible dumpster fire. Never in my life have I booted up an Atari Jaguar emulator, but I guess there's a first for everything. And don't even get me started on how much of a pain in the ass that ordeal was. This is admittedly a little bit of a digression, but I'm not sure what the problem was, but it was like pulling teeth trying to map my controls properly. And even then, certain keys kept binding to the same input, and honestly, I'm doing way more work than I should have to just play Bubsy 2.5. This game isn't good, and it's just a weird little extra appendage grown off the side of Bubsy 1 and 2. If you want to play this just to say you have, I get it, but that's literally the only reason anyone should ever boot this thing up. It's genuinely shocking to me how at this point, Bubsy has had three console entries plus a Game Boy game come out, none of which even approach the realm of decent, and Bubsy's just... Still trucking along, not a care in the world. I mean this with absolutely no hyperbole when I say three games in and I genuinely have no idea how this is a continued series that spans across multiple decades. And now for probably the most infamous game of the bunch, and the one I was least looking forward to having to play yet again. If any of you saw my video about a year ago where I checked out a list of the supposed worst games of all time, I'm sure none of you were surprised to see that Bubsy 3D was on there. Back then though, I actually called it quits once I got to the very first boss. For the life of me, I could not figure out how to even damage it, and I was trying to look at the game within the context of however I would have experienced it when it first came out. Because of that, I was trying to avoid looking stuff up, and once I spent too much time trying to figure out what I was supposed to do, I dipped out. I had beaten the main stages of the first world anyway, so I pretty much already knew what the game was offering me. This time around, though, I wanted to at least see if I could make it past that boss and see what the next world looked like, so I did just that. But I digress, let's talk about the whole situation here first. Bubsy 3D is Accolade's attempt at tossing Bubsy into the third dimension. Had this come out earlier, like maybe on the Sega Saturn or something, I may have been a little bit more accepting of it. Unfortunately, it did not. It came out, uh, after Super Mario 64. Now, I get that there's no way they could have known what Nintendo was cooking up, but even so, it's so far off that it's pretty inexcusable. This thing is bad. So I won't bother going over the story since I really have not mentioned Bubsy's story up until this point. All you need to know is that the main antagonists of the series, the Woolies, are pissed again. The main goal of each stage is to navigate your way to the end while collecting atoms and secret rocket parts that are hidden in each level, but I think the latter part is optional. I actually have no idea what the atom goal is for the stages, if I'm being honest. All I know is if I try to beat a stage without collecting enough atoms, I can't finish it. The atoms can also be used to attack enemies who can also be jumped on top of, which is easier said than done because the camera and viewing angles in this game are atrocious. The first main issue here, besides, uh, the lack of any actual aesthetic or object textures making the entire world look like a test level is the fact that, for whatever reason, they implemented tank controls. 
It is a chore trying to get Bubsy to do literally anything here. You can either walk slow as piss or immediately ramp up to 5,000 miles an hour. And Bubsy also carries that momentum so you can't stop on a dime, not too dissimilar to Bubsy 1. The camera is set at this nauseatingly low angle that personally makes me sick because I get motion sickness pretty easily, followed by this upward tilt anytime you press the jump button. I do understand what the point of this was because they're trying to let the player see where they'll land to aid in platforming, but this only exists because of the lack of an adjustable camera. Hitboxes again make seemingly no sense here since sometimes I'll just sort of get close to an enemy and they hurt me, which by the way, takes 10,000 years because this long as f animation plays and halts your progress each time you get hit. And the main glide mechanic, Bubsy's main stupid staple since the first game, is completely neutered here and it operates very strangely. Instead of just being able to jump and then decide to glide whenever you deem appropriate, the glide needs to be activated before Bubsy's little flipping animation happens during a jump. Meaning, if you want to use the glide, there's a very tiny window to actually do so before jumping. This would be less egregious if not for the fact that the glide is needed to reach certain areas, by utilizing these fans on the ground, for example, to make Bubsy ascend. One teeny tiny little itty bitty problem, though. Since the glide is so unpredictable, Sometimes you'll try to use the fans, and Glide just decides not to work. Annoying, right? Well, it's made even worse because said fans hurt you if you touch them. Meaning sometimes you try to use the fans to get to the next part of the stage, and instead, you die. Speaking of using the Glide to ascend, that's a good segue into the whole boss situation. So, the first time around, I couldn't figure out what to do. I ran around the arena with the boss shooting at me, being too high in the air for me to pounce on. Want to know how to hit him? Apparently, when the shots he fires hit the ground, they create a gust of wind that you can use to glide above him. A completely invisible, not conveyed at all, why would that even happen gust of wind? Incredible. And this was still a pain in the ass due to needing to wrestle with the controls, but I did manage to beat him, eventually. So now I get to see what the next world is, right? To my surprise, there are other types of stages. This one being a water stage. <laughs> Great. That's... That's what this game needed. Apparently there's some other types too, but I'm not sticking around long enough to see them for myself. After the water stage, it's business as usual with these gaudy looking untextured polygon stages, and I don't have it in me to keep repeating this process over and over because playing this game is like watching grass grow while someone's kicking you in the shit. I guess because of how new 3D gaming was, I'll cut it a little bit of slack here. But once again, much like the rest of this series thus far, regardless of technological limitations, I don't understand how nobody once stood up during this game's development and said, hey, uh, wait, this isn't fun. We should try maybe making it fun. So we've made it to maybe the only, um, I don't want to say, I don't want to say good, but playable Bubsy game ever made. There's like one more that might still fit this description, but this one is definitely the better of the two. But I use this term very loosely. It is better. It is not good. Once again, this is not my first rodeo with this game. See, a pretty long time ago, I did cover it in a video called Reboots Nobody Asked For, and that brings us to the topic at hand. If you're completely out of the loop, you're probably wondering why this game looks multiple generations ahead of the last, and that would be because it is. As I said before, this Bobcat refuses to die, and after over 20 years following the release of Bubsy 3D, Bubsy The Woolly Strike Back came out on PS4 and PC. The game was developed by Black Forest Games, who previously revived the Gianna Sisters series with Gianna Sisters Twisted Dreams, a game whose cover you've probably seen floating around for the past couple generations. I played some of that game a while back, and I actually found it to be pretty good with some unique mechanics. All their games seem to look exactly the same though, so looking at Gianna Sisters Twisted Dreams and then looking at Bubsy the Woolly Strike Back, it's pretty obvious that this is their thing. I'm not in love with the art style and the lighting they choose to use, but if you can get past that, at the very least, the game actually does control relatively well. I can't say the same quality went into the level design though, and there's a very large lack of polish overall, but the controls do feel good or at least okay. This could be based on their own merit, or it could be maybe based on the fact that Bubsy has always uh, historically controlled like dog sh**. This time around, Bubsy has a couple different options. He has a regular jump, a kind of lunge attack that can be used to take out breakable walls, and now the glide button actually has two functions. Pressing it while in the air does activate the glide, but it can also be used as a bit of a double jump as well. Hitboxes are also still very touchy and weird, but since the controls feel better, it's all a lot more manageable overall. Now this game is very, very short. 
This one screen that you see here is the entire overworld. This is all she wrote. What you see is what you get, and the game can be beaten in like an hour. I say beaten because that's how long it'll take you if you just make a beeline to the end of each stage, which is probably what you'll end up wanting to do anyway, because most of this game's intended length comes from the fact that the game is absolutely littered with collectible yarn balls, which is honestly where most of this game's level design exists. See, if you just say F the yarn balls and run to the end of the stage, most stages are pretty straightforward and flat without really much challenge. However, the stages are built with a lot of vertical areas above and below you, which house hundreds of yarn balls per stage, as well as secret keys, which unlock a vault at the end of each stage, which houses more yarn balls. If you actually take the time to tediously collect all of them, this game could easily take three times as long, but since there's really no payoff for it besides completion, and the act of collecting said yarn balls gets very old very fast, you'll probably quickly get tired of it and start playing it just to get to the end. And that's pretty much every single stage in this game, as it really doesn't offer much variety, at least until the last world, and even then, that isn't all that much different either. The one area this game almost sort of shines in are the bosses, of which there are three, one at the end of each area. It's nothing too exciting, but they actually do require you to learn patterns and even call for some advanced movement you kind of need to figure out on the fly, especially in the case of the second boss. Actually, attacking bosses, though, kind of sucks. The hitbox is once again weird, and it's easy to take damage when attempting to land a hit. And even when you do, it doesn't really feel very satisfying. The bosses also weirdly retain the damage they take even after you die, so you have your entire pool of lives to use to take down the bosses, which admittedly are still a little difficult, all things considered. And of course, it wouldn't be the Wooly Strike Back without once again hundreds of yarn balls to collect in even the boss arenas, which weirdly in between boss phases, the yarn balls just sort of fall from the sky for no reason. True completion of each stage requires you to beat each respective level without dying, opening up each vault, and collecting every yarn ball. I have no idea what happens if you do 100% the game, but this is all a tall ask, and I'm really not trying to find out. One cool feature, though, is that there's a verbosity slider in the settings, so you can actually shut Bubsy the f*** up or make it so Bubsy never shuts the f*** up. Dealer's choice! I'm really not sure what possessed Black Forest Games or Accolade to want to reanimate Bubsy's corpse, but literally nobody asked for this to happen. It's like they saw the revival of all these beloved franchises and wanted to throw their hat in the ring too, without taking into account that people in general were never really clamoring for Bubsy in the first place. I feel like if anything they were trying to capitalize on the fact that he isn't popular, like cash in on the meme of it all, but uh, yeah, I don't really think that worked out. Still though, this is honestly probably the only Bubsy game that's almost actually worth playing, and it's currently like $4, so go have a blast, or, well, go have a time, I guess. Well, if you thought Bubsy's random revival with the last game was strange, this one is even weirder, and I can think of even less reasons why this one exists. Two years later, Bubsy Paws on Fire was released for the PS4, PC, and later on was ported to the Nintendo Switch. This time around, Bubsy's art style has been switched up yet again, as well as his, uh, genre for some reason. It's pretty well known that the entire Bubsy series genre is a straightforward 2D platformer. Even at its absolute worst, the games have always been first and foremost platformers at their core. While I guess this is still technically a form of a platformer, Bubsy Paws on Fire, instead of being a traditional 2D platformer, is an auto-runner. Bros. I guess I'll touch on the story this time because there's cutscenes, but Bubsy and his friends are celebrating the 14th annual Yarn Ball when the Woolies twin queens Polly and Esther warn him about the return of the corrupt entrepreneur Winker P. Ham, the final boss of Bubsy 2, who is capturing animals across the universe for his own personal zoo, the Amazutorium. Once again, the story isn't really important here, but this game sees Bubsy working together with the Woolies against a common enemy. And this time, Bubsy isn't the only playable character. In fact, there's three other characters that you can not only play as, uh, but you essentially have to play as. There's Bubsy, who has his traditional glide and a dash mechanic, Virgil, who can double jump and duck to avoid hazards, and the Wooly, a bit of a genre mix-up character where you basically play a uh, side-scrolling shoot-em-up. Those are the three main characters, each having their own slightly altered version of each stage. I did say there was one more character, though, and he's a little different. Arnold the Armadillo has his own unique stage for each respective normal stage, but can only be played once unlocked. While playing as the other characters, you need to collect three pieces of an Arnold medal while making your way to the end, one per character. Once all three medals are collected, you unlock the Arnold stage, which takes place underground and is not too dissimilar to the special stages in Sonic 2, but it is a 3D stage instead of a 2D one. I'm also pretty sure it's impossible to die on these stages, but uh, you do have to watch out for bags of farts. Why are there just 
bags of farts underground. Now, each character earns a medal once a stage is completed, and each subsequent stage has a minimum number of medals needed to access it, which is why these other characters aren't optional. If you just play as Bubsy, you can't earn enough medals to get very far. Not that I personally got very far, because compared to the Wooly Strike Back, this game is 10,000 hours long, and I'm not sure if it's apparent from the gameplay, but it's extremely, extremely monotonous. There really isn't much variation in Pause on Fire stages, and needing to play each one multiple times is a chore. The only mix-up that happens is the boss fight at the end of each world, which is, much like the previous game, the only thing remotely engaging, due to needing to actually learn boss patterns. Similar to the last game, there is a collectible in each stage that you need to collect a bunch of. Naturally, with Bubsy, it's the yarn balls. For Virgil, it's these atom things or whatever. For the Wooly, it's golden yarn balls, and Arnold collects crystals. Collecting all of them in a stage, I guess, equates to full completion, but primarily these are used for currency to purchase new costumes for each character. Like I said, this game is very long for what it is. It has three main worlds consisting of 27 main levels, but as I mentioned, each level has four levels. There's a lot of meat here. Unfortunately, it's not high quality meat, and it's more like having 900 bags of store brand potato chips. Sure, it may be all you can eat, but at what cost? I guess I can at least say the cutscenes are okay. They're nothing amazing, but the voice acting is actually pretty decent, and while I don't really particularly like any of the characters, especially Bubsy himself, they're all voiced and portrayed well. Especially Bubsy himself, who probably is the most authentic and least try-hard sounding incarnation of the character this time around. Now, it's probably clear I don't really like this game. I can't bring myself to say it's bad, necessarily. It's just a whole lot of nothing. It's much better suited to be a mobile game as well, considering the gameplay is so monotonous that I don't know how anyone can actually sit in front of a TV and play this for hours. I honestly don't know what possessed them to make an auto-runner, but this sh is not it, at least for me. Maybe if you like auto-runners, this would appeal to you, but I feel like there's much better options and for cheaper. Like Super Mario Run, for example, which is a much more involved and much more engaging game. Not to mention, the plethora of mobile games available that feature similar gameplay and can be played for free. Where it stands now, actually digitally purchasing Bubsy Paws on Fire will run you $25, which is absurd for what's on offer here. It's quite literally paying for quantity over quality. Sure, the game is pretty long, all things considered, but it's absolutely not worth the asking price. As I said before, Bubsy Paws on Fire isn't necessarily what I would call bad. It's fine and does have some variety with the different characters and unlockable secret stages for each main stage. Some of the stage gimmicks are at least slightly creative, but other than that, it really just does the same thing over and over again for multiple hours, and I don't have the time or attention span for that. And that's all of them, at least up until 2019. Although the Bobcat doesn't know how to stay dead, so I'm not convinced he's gone for good. I'm sure he'll pop up again at some point with some garbage no one has any interest in playing. Now, normally this is the part of the video where, as I close out, I go over the good and the bad, and I say what I liked overall, say what I really didn't like, make a suggestion of which ones you should try and which ones should be avoided at all costs, but honestly, this time around, I'm sorry, but it might surprise you that I don't think I have one actual good thing to say. Look, if you want to play something just for the sake of it, the last two recent games I talked about are probably the only ones that are playable. They aren't what I'd call good, mind you, but unlike most of the games here, they won't make you want to rip your hair out. They, in fact, are video games that can be played and completed, which is more than I can say about any of the other games in this godforsaken game series. Bubsy sucks. Bubsy's always sucked. He's always going to suck. But damn it if he isn't resilient. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, there's a couple other videos right there you can check out. And if you want to see everything I upload, subscribe and then tap the bell icon. And if you want to help support the channel, I also have a Patreon right there too.